Well, good morning. I'd like to welcome you here this morning. As we get started, I have a lot of things to uh, bring to your attention, so I'll try and move through this list very quickly. But um, there's a lot of stuff going on, and I just wanted to highlight some of the things. First of all, today is the last day. Well, actually, it's never the last day you can give money for something. But, but this is the last day for our, our push to erase the, the water project um, funding that we need. Uh, after, after March, we're going to just take the money out of our general fund to cover that expense. Uh, so today's the last day that you can officially give to that project. Um, if you give to it after today, your money will just go into general fund. Uh, but we had several hundred dollars that we still needed to raise. So if you uh, care to give to that, you can just mark your offering envelope for uh, water project, water, public water, anything with the word water in it, and that's where it'll go today. Uh, today is also, as far as I know, the last day that they're doing a food distribution at Faith Assembly. Uh, it starts at 12.30. It is USDA uh, boxes that are... Um, overstock and so they have to be just given away to anybody who's willing to take them if you would like to get one of those boxes you can go down to faith assembly uh, which is on it's on fishing creek road uh, if you need to know where that is you can talk to me afterwards and i can give you specific directions on how to get there this thursday we will be having our monday thursday dinner and service uh, here at the church at six o'clock Today's the last day to sign up because we need to know how many people we're preparing for. So there's a sign-up sheet over there uh, on the table right over there. If you could sign up for that. And we also would like to set up after the service this morning. So if you're able to help do that, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. After, the, after our morning service, we'll be moving chairs out of the way, put it, setting up tables. So again, we need to know if you haven't already signed up, we need you to sign up so that we can count the sign-up sheet and set up tables. And then Sunday morning, um, we will be having our resurrection service here at our regular time at 1030. Uh, but there is also a sunrise service that is, uh, that is facilitated by the New Cumberland Ministerium. And it will be at 645 in Borough Park in the gazebo. It's a great opportunity to fellowship with other believers from the area. So I'd in encourage you to go to both of those. And um, please bring a guest with you for our resurrection service next Sunday morning. One other announcement that I have that is very timely uh, because there's a deadline tomorrow. We haven't done much publicizing of the Morning Star banquet because, uh, because of COVID restrictions, their numbers were greatly limited. It was originally supposed to be just April 8th, and they could only have 100 people. And that, very, and that includes hotel staff, the, the, the um, servers, the workers, that's everybody. And so they very quickly had that filled. And so we didn't publicize it. But uh, starting this coming, uh, a week from today, Pennsylvania is loosening restrictions so they can have 250 people. And they were able to add another date. So it's April 8th and April 9th at the Radisson. If you're interested in going though, they need to have a count to the Radisson by uh, sometime this week. So they have drawn the deadline for registration as tomorrow. If you, and you can uh, contact Stephanie, or her work email and her work phone number are there. If you don't have a chance to write those down, if you let me know, I can, I can get that information to you also. So um, it is, like I said, you can go either the 8th or the 9th. They have openings uh, on both those. They went from being able to have 100 people to having 500 people because they've got 250 people at each, de each, um, each date. So there's a lot of space all of a sudden. Uh, so if you uh, if you want more information, uh, you can talk to me about that after the service also. Um, those are all the announcements that I have listed, but there is one other thing that, um, I apologize to Jim, I didn't get this to him. Um, this evening, in place of our prayer meeting, we're going to be showing a, a movie, it's called 
the light of, light of the world. It's a LUMO project, and what it is is a, um, a compilation of scripture from all four gospels that has been, um, it's narrated and, and also acted, that, acted out. So you get to see the life of Christ and have it narrated with actual scripture. Um, and and it, it does it in a really neat way. If you're not familiar with the LUMO project, you can uh, go to their YouTube page and get more information about them, but they have entire, the entire gospel account, all four gospels, word for word in long, long format um, online. But this is, like I said, it's just a, they've pulled sections out, so it's only an hour long, uh, but it's just a neat experience. And so we're gonna show that tonight at six o'clock here at the church. Um, so that will be during the time when we normally have our prayer meeting. Uh, okay, those are all the announcements I have. Let me pray for us and we will start our service. Father, we come into your presence this morning expectant, longing to spend time with you, eager to encounter you desiring to be changed by you. We invite your Holy Spirit here, to this place, but more than just to this place. Holy Spirit, would you speak to each one of us, do a work in each one of us. We want to be changed by you. We want our lives to be radically transformed, that we would look like Jesus Christ to a world who needs to see him. And it's in his name that we come. Amen. Wanda? Amen. Um, let's stand and sing to Jesus.
And we can have it all because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. Without that, it would not be possible.
Lord Jesus, thank you for life. We thank you that you gladly, for the joy set before you, endured the cross. You chose to be obedient to your Father and ransom us. And we are eternally grateful. Lord, we look forward to that day when we will see you face to face. But until then, Lord, I pray that we would live lives that bring you glory and honor. As we live for you and share the good news that there is hope with the world. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Yeah, I don't know. Do you call it a church planting strategy? It just makes sense when you're wanting to impact a community spiritually that you serve that community and bring whatever resources you can to provide schooling options, water, health care, learning centers, whatever could benefit the whole community. When the local Alliance Church in Belleville began to have visitors from this non-Loti area, they quickly started a Bible study group, secured a large piece of property and built three classrooms and now they've expanded to six classrooms and serve about 200 children. Jesus says in Luke 22, I am among you as one who serves. Thank you for supporting us. Thank you for praying for us. Thank you for allowing us to serve the Lord Jesus here. I think it's funny that uh, Esther, that was Esther Schaefer, uh, Andrew and Esther, our missionaries in Burkina Faso. Uh, I think it's funny that she said, is it a church planting strategy? I don't know. Uh, sometimes I think Esther just simply sees opportunities and takes advantage of them. But that, that is church planting strategy. Uh, she, made, she made mention of an area, she referred to it as a non loti um, a non loti area and what that is is there's this thing that's happening in the city where they're working the city is, has doubled in size over the past 10 years um, as people leave villages to move into city where there's more opportunities uh, the city is full and so they just keep adding on to it and a non loti area is an area that has not yet been, been recognized by the government as zoned for residential use. So they're in essence, my words, not hers, but kind of like, almost like refugee camps. They're just people move in and just start, okay, I'm just gonna stay here. The, the property doesn't belong to anybody. It doesn't have any, any um, utilities, nothing. They just start living there. And so there's these little communities that just pop up. And as you can imagine, with that happening, the, the physical needs are phenomenal. There's, there's no infrastructure, there are no schools, there are no, uh, there's, there's literally nothing, because it's not recognized by the government as a community. And so their church has taken this opportunity to start providing those things, those essentials, those basic needs, schooling, just caring for people, meeting physical needs, and they're taking that opportunity, and as they're doing that, they're also being able to introduce people to Jesus. This is why we do this. I'm like, yeah, that's probably about the best church planting strategy there is. You care for people, you show the love of Christ to people in practical ways, and they want to know more. And you get to share Jesus then, not just in the practical ways, but through word and testimony. This is, this is who we follow. This is how you can too follow him. And so it's just this really neat thing that's happening. Um, and she's, 
in her newsletter that she sent out, she's asked for prayer for these, these places that are happening all over the city, that they'll be able to, to uh, minister to people and have an impact for Christ in those areas. So um, I just wanted to share that with you. And, and if you just, just watch the video, you, you almost miss what's going on there. But imagine Harrisburg doubling in size in, in just a few years what the needs would be, and yet we have some infrastructure for that. They are meeting needs because there's no one else is there to do it. So as you think about it, pray for Andrew and Esther and their whole team as they uh, just continue to find creative ways to share the gospel message. We're going to be wrapping up our series, Time in the Wilderness, this morning um, as we draw to a close the Lenten season. We're looking forward to, we're entering Holy Week, um, and I just want to encourage you to be focused on what God has to offer. Um, We're going to be talking about uh, the the wilderness experience being a time of of new beginnings, There are opportunities, like Esther was talking about, um, opportunities all around us. And sadly, I think we see problems, but not the opportunities. So we want to be looking through the eyes of God at what God's doing so that we don't miss opportunities that he has in front of us. Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, as we come to you, we thank you for... Andrew and Esther and the work that they have been called to, but the work that they are so passionate about, um, regardless of what the specifics are, connecting with people, sharing their lives with them, and most importantly, sharing you, their Savior, with them. I pray your blessing on them as they uh, as they work in these non-low-T areas, as they look for opportunities to meet practical needs so that they can also meet spiritual needs. Lord, I ask that you would give them wisdom, give them the resources that they need, give them fruit for their labor. And Lord, we ask that for us too, that we would have the wisdom to, to Uh, Take advantage of the eyes to see the opportunities that are before us, wisdom to take advantage of those opportunities, and that we would live lives that bring you glory and honor as we do that. Now, Lord, as we we look one last time at the wilderness, um, Lord, I pray that you would encourage us that there is hope beyond the wilderness. Thank you, Lord. Amen. As we have done um, throughout this series, we're going to start in Mark chapter 1, just looking again briefly at just these few verses that show this um, almost, you almost miss it, it happens so quickly, Uh, but we're going to start in Mark chapter 1, starting back up a couple verses in verse 9 and read through verse 15. Mark records it this way, it says, at that time Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. A voice came from heaven. You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the spirit sent him out into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. In just those couple short verses, we see Jesus go into the wilderness. But we also see him 40 days later come out of the wilderness. You see, we're not meant to live in the wilderness. Wilderness is a state. I don't mean like state, like, state of Pennsylvania, I mean like a, well, the, the, de, the um, Webster defines it this way, a state is a particular condition that someone or something is in 
at a specific time. We talk about being in a state of confusion, a state of shock, a state of denial, a state of transition. They're temporary. They're not meant to be permanent. We are not called to live in the wilderness. We go through the wilderness, but that's exactly what it is. We go through. Wilderness experiences are hard. They're traumatic. They're life-changing. Things are never the same on the other side of the wilderness. But praise God, there is the other side of the wilderness. And so this morning, I just want to talk briefly about a time of new beginnings. Solomon, uh, in, in a book that really needs to be read start to finish, the, the book of Ecclesiastes, if you're not familiar with it, be careful not to pick verses out and, and build an entire theology on just a verse or two because Solomon is struggling. He's the wisest man to ever live. And yet, somewhere along the line, he decided to depend on his own wisdom and really just kind of wound up in this dark place. Um, Writes things like, meaningless, meaningless. Life is, all of life is just meaningless. And as he struggles and, and, and captures his thoughts in the book of Ecclesiastes, he does recognize that there are seasons that we go through. And in Ecclesiastes chapter three, the first eight verses, he, he recounts all these different things that happen. He says this, starting in verse one of Ecclesiastes three, there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to tear down, a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace, And we might add a time to go into the wilderness, but also a time to come out. The reality is that we don't choose to go into the wilderness. More often than not, suddenly, without a moment's notice, we're plunged into the wilderness. You get called into the office and you hear the words, your services are no longer needed, and you're plunged into the wilderness. I think we should call off the wedding. You're plunged into the wilderness. Mom, I'm pregnant. Thrown into the wilderness suddenly. Dad, I've been arrested. I'm transferred, I've been transferred and we're moving. Mom had a stroke, how soon can you get here? We're plunged into trauma. Life is never the same after that. There are events that mark, it's a a demarcation line, and there's life before and there's life after. And we see those events as a, a shift, a change. Something happens. We're we're never the same on the other side of the wilderness. But there is life on the the other side of the wilderness. According to Dante, written over the gates of hell are the words, all hope abandon, ye who enter here. The reality is, without Christ, wilderness experiences are unending. We don't know how to get through them. We don't get through them successfully. We might navigate them, but there's no hope. Christ brings hope. A few weeks ago, as we talked about a time of challenge, he said one of the temptations is to give up. And the challenge is to persevere. Perseverance is possible when you recognize that on the outset, heading into the the wilderness, there is a time to come out of the wilderness, a new beginning. 
Yes, life will look different, but it will be life. We're called to that. There's these couple verses that show up at the very beginning of the account of Abraham's life. The, the account of Abraham and his life, before his name's even changed, is Abram. The account starts in chapter 12 of the book of Genesis. But at the very end of chapter 11, we see Abraham's, Abram's father, Terah, take his entire family, extended family, all of their possessions, and it says that, that Terah and everybody else set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. There was a destination, Canaan, the promised land. And Abraham's story is all about Abraham hearing the calling from God to leave where he was living and go to Canaan. I can't help but think, now Genesis 11 doesn't tell us specifically that God called his father, Terah, to that journey. What it tells us is that Terah was headed there and then gave up. Part of the way through the journey, he said, I'm just staying, well, let's just stay here. And I can't help but wonder what, how it would have been different if Terah had persevered, had moved through and gone to the promised land. What about Moses? The first 40 years of Moses' life, he's raised as an Egyptian in Pharaoh's home until he takes a stand for his, for his people, the Israelites, who are living as slaves in captivity, stands up for one of them, winds up killing an Egyptian soldier, and when it's found out that he did that, he runs off, flees into the wilderness. What would have happened if Moses didn't listen to the voice of God from the burning bush, if Moses had just decided to stay in the wilderness? Or the children of Israel, when they quite literally were traveling through the wilderness to the promised land, they just said, you know what, we're done, we'll stay here. We're not called to live in the wilderness. The reality is we don't get to choose, we don't choose to go into the wilderness, but we can make the choice to go through, to, to lean on God, to depend on God, and to come out the other side stronger, bearing scars perhaps, but learning. We talked about a time of learning. We talked about a time of challenge, a time of doubt, a time of dependence, a time of comfort. All those things we get from the wilderness experience so that we can have a new beginning, move on to something. Jesus tells the story of what we refer to as the prodigal son. It's a story actually about three people, a father and two sons. But most of the story is taken up in an account of the one son that we refer to as the prodigal. He, in essence, turns his back on his family in a very insulting way, tells his father in, in so many words, I wish you were dead, can I have my inheritance now? And then heads off with his newfound wealth to live a life that he wants to pursue. Money runs out, famine hits, and he's plunged into a wilderness. Now, in large part, that's his own doing. Sometimes we do cause our own wilderness experiences. Not always. Sometimes we do. We bring them on ourselves. But Jesus said, when he came to his senses, he recognized there is something for me that is not here. He was living as a pauper, feeding pigs, and was so hungry and so destitute that he wanted to eat the food that he was giving to pigs. 
but he came to his senses. He left the wilderness experience. He went home to his father. And I can't help but imagine that his perspective of his father changed dramatically. He is welcomed home. He is restored completely. He is loved. As, as he's still afar, far off, Jesus, as he tells the story, says, well, he's still far off. His father sees him coming and runs to him and welcomes him home. He restores him. The son was never meant to live in the pigsty. But he learned there. He struggled there. And I believe he had a much different perspective of the father's love after that experience. A perspective that perhaps his older brother would never understand. Jesus kind of leaves the story hanging. We don't actually know what happens with the elder brother. We know that the, the father welcomes the younger brother home, throws a big party for him, and celebrates that he's there, that he has survived his wilderness experience, if you will. And the elder brother refuses to because he feels entitled. He feels left out. He feels neglected. Could it be because he never experienced the wilderness? See, going through the wilderness changes us. It molds us. It shapes us. It refines us. It's painful, but there's growth. We are not meant to stay there, but we do grow by going through those times. Paul writes these words in 2 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 17. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. The ultimate wilderness experience, struggle, pain, death, Christ put to an end. He conquered it. We'll celebrate that next week. We'll look more at that next week, at what Christ did and why he did it. But recognize this. As Paul writes there, he says, a new creation has come. There's something different when you've come out of death into life, when you come out of any wilderness experience to new life. There's something different. We mark tragic events as time before this happened and time after this happened. I've talked several times about the year 2001. The Irving family went through all kinds of struggles in 2001. We had a house fire, we had a burglary, I had a motorcycle accident. There was life before that and there was life after that. That's a a, a point at which I see things change. I would not choose to go through any of those experiences, but I grew in all of those experiences. And life is different now. There are new beginnings awaiting us if we're willing to allow God to take us through the wilderness and bring us out of it. Jesus said in John chapter 10, um, I love, this is one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible, and usually I just quote the second half of it. But John 10.10 says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. 
See, the thief comes only to abandon you in the wilderness. Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. That's the work of Satan. Hopelessness, despair. But Christ has come so that we might have life and have it to the full. That means, yes, going through wilderness times. Wilderness experiences mold us. They shape us. They refine us. They are not pleasant, but they are transformative, if you let them be. John Piper gave a talk uh, to a, a group of young people that he wound up expanding and, into an entire book, and he wrote a book called Don't Waste Your Life. John Piper, sometime after writing that book, was diagnosed with cancer. And he wrote a much shorter version of the book, um, but a, a spinoff of that called Don't Waste Your Cancer. See, trauma, struggles, difficulties, cancer is a wilderness experience. You can just sit down and despair, or you can allow God to take you through it, to carefully lovingly walk you through difficult times so that you are transformed, so that there is something new for you, awaiting for you on the other side. Jesus does that for us. Jesus gives us hope, reason, purpose for enduring the pain Christ said in John 16, verse 33, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. There are struggles. I think it's, I, I think it's so humorous um, in an ironic sort of way, not in a truly funny sort of way, when people talk about prosperity gospel. Just come to Jesus and your life will be better. Your life will be better in that Jesus is going through the difficult times with you, yes. But your life is not going to be easy. As a matter of fact, Jesus promised the second person in the Trinity, God the Son, promised life is hard. Life is a struggle. I've told you these things so that you might have peace. I've told you all about me. I've told you why I'm here. I've told you that I won't leave you alone. I've told you all these things so that you can have peace because you are going to have trouble. My prayer for you, my goal for you is that you have peace with the trouble. As you go through the wilderness, allow me to sustain you. I've overcome it. I went through the wilderness. I can get you through that. That's Christ's offer to each one of us. That we will not abandon hope, that we will not sit down and dwell in, but that we will move through. If you're in the midst of the wilderness experience, if you are going through difficulty, pain, sorrow, sadness, loss, Understand this, Christ's desire is to walk you through it and bring you out of it. His desire is not for you to spend all of eternity in that wilderness. He allows us to go through those, those difficulties so that we are refined, so that we're made more like Him. He went through it successfully he came out the other side next week as i mentioned we're going to look at the ultimate victory over the alternate ultimate wilderness experience sin and death christ even navigated that successfully and we will celebrate that next week 
For now, though, my, my encouragement to you is don't allow your current struggle, your current difficulty, your current pain, your current heartache to define you. We don't choose to go into the wilderness, but we need to choose to come out. Christ's desire is that every wilderness experience brings a new beginning. Allow him to walk you through and bring you safely out the other side so that then you too can encourage others. Do you remember last week we talked about uh, the time of comfort? We go through wilderness experiences so that we can, first of all, be comforted by God, but then secondly, so that we can turn around and be comforters for God. Don't waste your cancer. Don't waste your wilderness. Look at it as an opportunity for a new beginning. Lord Jesus, it is easy for us to take our eyes off of you when we're in the wilderness experience. It's all we can see at times. I think about Peter as he walked on the water. He's walking toward you. He's doing something incredible but then the wind and the waves caught his attention. And he began to sink. He began to despair. Lord, I thank you that in all of Scripture, it's probably the shortest but also most heartfelt prayer uttered. Lord, save me. Father, we need to be saved from our sin. We need to be saved from death. But we also need to be saved from wilderness experiences. We ask you to, Lord Jesus, to walk us through them. We depend on you. We need you to get us through them. Not simply so that we can be out of the wilderness, but so that we have a new beginning. Lord, thank you that you have given us, you have made us new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. There is a new beginning for us spiritually. And our desire is that we share that with others so that they have hope, so that they do not despair. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for new beginnings, even though they come through difficulties, even though they come through trials, through struggles. We depend on you to bring us through the wilderness. We look to you, Lord Jesus, as the author and perfecter of our faith. And we celebrate you. Amen. Live lives that show that you have hope that the wilderness experience doesn't define you. It molds you and it shapens you. It refines you, but it does not define you. Now go be the church. You are dismissed.